welcome everyone. On, on behalf of the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies and the Labor Solidarity Project at the University of Washington Tacoma, I'd like to every, welcome everyone to the first installment of our spring seminar series. And this actually begins the, um, the official beginning of our second year of public programming. So I'd just like to take a second and thanks, ev thank everyone here for your continued support. Joining us today is Dr. Heather Berg, who's an assistant professor of women, gender, and sexuality studies at Washington University in St. Louis. And as of this month, she is officially the author of Porn Work, Sex, Labor, and Late Capitalism, which was just published by uh, University of North Carolina Press. Congratulations. Uh, I had a chance to uh, read and then reread an advanced copy of this book. Um, and I was just absolutely blown away on so many different fronts. Um, I think the, the depth of the analysis of the industry and its history is extremely impressive. Uh, the way that you've situated porn work within sort of the, uh, you know, the larger vocational hellscape that is late capitalism. And I think really the, um, you know, the attention and the respect with which you approach the folks in the industry, I think there was like, um, you know, uh, a, a real care came through there. And I think a, a real deference to the experiences and the expertise of the many people you, you spoke to during this project. Um, and I think that all stems from this, you know, this central observation uh, of this work that porn work is work, right? And that folks who work in porn need to be recognized <laughs> as workers and therefore included in any larger conversation surrounding, you know, workers' rights, solidarity and, and resistance. Um, having said that, you know, porn work is a unique form of labor that really challenges many of our understandings about work, right? Because it's like simultaneously a, a site of exploitation uh, but it's also this, as you make wonderfully clear, this site of resistance, right? That's made possible through uh, many of the contradictions that porn work itself actively generates. Um, so I think sort of panning back from your book after two reads through, you know, porn work really to me reveals that there's absolutely nothing easy about watching porn. Right? Mm -hmm. so I just want to take a second to thank you, Dr. Heather Berg, for joining us today from St. Louis um, in clarifying some of these contradictions and, and, and maybe even revealing what we should be looking at when we're looking at porn work. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Heather Berg. Thank you for sharing your time and your expertise. Well, thank you so much for having me and for that really generous introduction. Um, you're one of the first people who not only read the book, but then told me what you thought. And it was so uh, heartening to hear, hear these kind words in advance and also today. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and thank you really to you all for being here. I know we are all so zoomed out at this point. Um, I myself have signed up for several Zoom talks and then bailed at the last minute, especially meeting ones. So I really um, am appreciating what, a, what an act of, of generosity it is for you all to be in this space. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna open us up with a few minutes of opening comments, just plant some seeds that we might return to. Um, and then I'm really looking forward to your questions after the talk. So um, I'll start today where the story starts for me and for this book. After we talked about wages, connecting with scene partners, policy, and how porn performance is a lot like working in a bookstore, Connor Habib paused to trouble the work language I was using. I don't like the worker part, Habib told me. I'll use porn star, that's fine. I like being a constellation instead of a laborer. After that interview, I started to ask interviewees if porn worker resonated with them. I absolutely am a porn worker, Ella Darling responded. I respect it if someone doesn't want to think of this as work, but it is. You can think of it as dancing on the moon. That doesn't change the fact that this is how you pay your bills. My book tries to think through workers' interventions into their jobs, how they think about the politics of authenticity and identity, and the question of what we should ask for from the state in the context of these questions and these tensions. The central question then becomes, what do we mean when we call porn work? Is this to legitimize it or to reveal how unexceptional it is? 
How should we talk about the realities of paying the bills at the same time as we acknowledge that at the end of the day, nobody wants to be a worker? So today I'm gonna to talk about porn workers' struggles within and against work to borrow from Kathy Weeks and what they might offer scholarship and activism around straight work, that is non-sex work. The first thing that porn workers' struggles offer, I think, is a labor politics that doesn't valorize work. A call for labor rights for people who don't want to be workers. And organizing at the intersection of the claim sex work is work and the parallel claim fuck work. So today's talk, like my book, is grounded in 81 interviews with performers, management, and crew in field work such as sets visits in the US porn industry and, and policy meetings, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna focus on the connections and the disconnections among porn workers and other struggles for labor justice, but I'm also happy to answer any questions you might have later that are more specific to the industry. So first I wanna to think together about why we should listen to porn workers when we're talking about labor solidarity and labor justice. I'm gonna make a few claims here. Um, one is that porn work reveals really deep contradictions at the core of late capitalism. Workers exit traditional jobs in search of autonomy, but they often find precarity on the other side. Pleasure can make work more livable, but also get us to do more of it. The authenticity we seek in sex and work can be sold off for parts, and it can also be sustaining. Workers organize against the twin forces of state surveillance and state neglect. And solidarities break down when workers escape managerial control by becoming managers themselves. These tensions are of course familiar to everyone in this space who's concerned with questions of labor justice around perhaps primarily straight work. And I'm gonna to argue today that the left should be paying attention to how porn workers theorize and navigate these questions in particular. So this isn't just a call for inclusion. It's true that sex workers have often been left out of labor rights struggles and they should be included but I'm going to off, uh, argue that this isn't just a question of adding their struggles, but that doing so actually shifts the terrain of the debate. This is for a few reasons. First, I think that laboring on the margins of respectability brings a sharper lens, and that manifests in a few ways. One of them is a longer historical memory for precarity and particularly the precarious conditions of gig work. So that's to say the gig economy isn't new, especially not here. It's also a community that often rejects nostalgia. There's no longing here in the way that we sometimes see from the labor left for a return to the factory or to the cubicle farm. You'll also see in this story a remarkably unromantic view of work. And that's from even workers who don't claim anti-capitalist politics. Even there, workers talk about producers as, quote, making money off of them in ways that you don't hear from many other workers, not least academics. Here, relations of extraction are perhaps less concealed, but workers also spend a lot of time thinking about exploitation because outsiders are constantly assuming special forms of exploitation in their work. I wanna say that this generates a different kind of critique on the part of workers themselves. It's also a community that is often moving against the respectability politics of inclusion. The sex worker thinkers I'm most invigorated by know that inclusion isn't on offer. And so they're less surprised when its promises fail us, when employers don't hold up their end of the bargain or when the state fails to protect it might be better to begin with the perspective as, as a sex worker activist collective hacking hustling puts it that quote, any system can be hacked, any system can be hustled. This book is also against the dignity of work. 
some sex worker organizers organize around the social usefulness of their work, the utility of porn to society, to sexual awakening, et cetera. But I'm most interested in people who avoid these claims. Here, I wanna say that porn's social value is that it's a job for people who can't or don't wanna do straight jobs and that that answer is enough. And finally, porn workers are exceptionally creative about hacks, finding inroads and finding cracks in the system and using them to their benefit. As many managers complain to me, they find these hacks at every turn and we'll return there. But first I wanna take a step back and think about how porn workers come to this position in the first place. That's because I don't think that we should ever tell stories about gig work without talking about the kinds of jobs workers left behind and how that leaving galvanized their class consciousness. So I'm gonna tell a short story here. My degree in art was taking me nowhere, said Anna Fox. After a few promotions, she was managing at a grocery store, but quote, still barely making enough to live. When she found out that porn would pay in one day what the grocery store did in a month, she thought, why would I go back? A month later, she quit the grocery store. I was just like, fuck overtime, she said. I'd rather be on overtime humping a hot dude or chick. The stress of this is way easier to trade over a nine to five. Straight jobs meant economic insecurity for many of the porn workers who left them, but they also just consumed too much of life. They were tedious and not fun. Other interviewees left nursing, investment banking, retail, and academia. This piece is not unique to the porn industry and it's not unique to this moment. Instead, sex workers have always pursued sexual labor, not just as an economic survival strategy, though that too, but at the same time, as a way to refuse more extractive and less pleasurable ways of working and living. The history of Black women's sex work as a refusal of domestic work is just one example of this. And I think there are important ties here to gig work discourse now. I want more in gig work discourse and acknowledgement that yes, Uber is a bad boss, but also some conversation about what workers are leaving behind. What are their material motivations? What forms of art autonomy are they seeking, even if they don't find them? And that's to say that gig workers, porn workers, among others, aren't stupid and they're not duped. And yet still, porn work is work and its conditions are often not good. I'm gonna offer a few notes on those conditions, but also a reminder that anything that seems violent about these standards is really commonplace in straight jobs too. The first and most obvious is the nature of exploitation under capitalism. As one director performer responded when I asked if whether he paid workers more because he'd been a performer himself, quote, what is the lowest rate I can pay people where I'd still get them to shoot for me? That is standard. Porn has extreme racist pay differentials, racist differentials in onset treatment. And as your own Dr. West has elaborated, racist representational norms that workers must navigate. Management has no incentive to ensure safe working conditions because workers, as in other gig work, pay all the costs if they get sick or injured at work. Porn is often also tedious. It's boring more than it is spectacularly injurious or uniquely fun. It offers the mundanities of workplace sexual harassment or just bosses who require you to act like their friend. It is also a space like many other straight jobs in which you find workplace cultures that expect a performance of loving the job and being there not just for the money. And this is intensified by management's and quote, ethical consumers demands for porn consumption that makes them feel better about paying for sexual labor. So workers have to do the work of filming a scene 
and then do the additional labor of pretending they're not working at all. They have to get paid and also pretend that that pay is tertiary. And that's to say that the things that many performers find most draining about porn work are rarely what outsiders assume. It's torn ligaments, not child trafficking. It's clingy co-stars, not being tricked into performances you don't know what to do. On one set, I visited a first time performer showed too much interest in his more experienced partner, pestering her during downtimes between filming and wanting to cuddle and kiss after the cameras had stopped rolling. She just wanted to go home, she told me later. It wasn't that the scene had been particularly bad, it was just that her rescue dog didn't like being home alone. I'm always interested in how disappointed some listeners, especially feminists are, when I tell stories like this, as if they're hoping that the stories of sensational violence are all true. But it's because of all of these conditions, ranging from the most extreme exploitation to mundane tedium, that performers often do everything they can to avoid working for other people. Performers with less social economic capital rely most on creative arrangements such as trade shoots and producing their own low budget scenes. That is workers who encounter the poorest treatment when they work under a boss are often quickest to try to escape those hierarchies. Racialized performers, for example, often self-produce as a way to circumvent racist good old boy pr producers and agents. Trans performers are quick to self-produce so that they may avoid the fetishizing norms of the trans genre. And this is to say that when I talk about worker managers and porn's class trouble, I'm not talking about a labor aristocracy. And still, managerial roles often mean subjecting other workers to the very conditions that you'd hope to escape. Porn's story of class struggle is particularly messy because class boundaries are less calcified here. They're even increasingly less so thanks to digitization and the explosion of platforms like OnlyFans, which let performers produce and distribute their own content. And so performer Samantha Grace explained, you have to do other things to make money. Film work is just a form of marketing. I work with other companies so that I can promote my own website, my own films, my own custom videos and pro doming. Grace's description of how she came to work in the porn industry. She chose sex work as an alternative to low wage retail jobs that left her thinking, oh my God, I'm never gonna get out of this, helps contextualize her approach. Retail work meant being trapped and sex work entrepreneurship promised an alternative. And so once there, she refused to limit herself to the kinds of sex work that in making money for someone else looked most like retail. Porn workers have a keen understanding of the relationships of ownership. They work for others so that they can promote their own websites, custom scenes, products, and services. It's a strategy that is intensely vulnerable to platforms own ever-changing terms of service agreements, to their own extractive payment structures, and to payment processors' discriminatory policy. It's also vulnerable to the constant onslaught of anti-sex worker law, such as FOSTA-SESTA of 2018. These are policies sold as ways to protect trafficking victims, but they actually make it harder to work independently and thus make workers more reliant on third parties and more vulnerable to the abuses that they, like other managers, perpetrate. But when the strategy to self-produce does work, it can mean significant autonomy for workers. This places them in liminal spaces in relationship to the regulatory state and also scholarship and activism, even spaces like the one we're in tonight. 
prevailing assumptions about porn as a contest between powerful managers and vulnerable workers break down. That's because porn workers are very rarely only workers. Instead, they occupy constantly shifting class positions as entrepreneurs, independent contractors, formal employees, contracted and freelance managers and producers. And this shapes and reshapes their perspectives in countless ways. But it's also not something to be fixed. Again, nobody wants to be a worker. This pisses managers off. In 2018, years into the web facilitated erosion of porn's class hierarchy, a director complained about performers' use of time on set to distribute content to fans on OnlyFans and premium Snapchat, services that allow fans to purchase access to performers' self-produced photos and videos. Quote, if you're gonna use my set as your personal studio and probably make more money than I do, maybe I should at least get a discount or leave your phone in your fucking car, he said. He added, I've been doing this over 25 years and I have a $16,000 camera, but some girl with an iPhone is probably making more money than me. Again, I wanna think about this in the context of gig economies more broadly where it might reveal not just the growing power of platform capitalism, but also the class struggle at work in this story. But if it's a problem for management that nobody wants to be a worker, and now foreign workers don't have to be, they never did, it's also a problem for the labor movement and sometimes for labor scholars. What to do with workers who don't want to be and aren't workers. Most porn workers would rather have no boss than one disciplined by the state or even collective bargaining. And prevailing discourse in the labor left would view this as kind of prototypical of neoliberal entrepreneurship. And it would assume a dynamic that makes broad-based solidarity impossible here. Competition cutthroat and working class identity elusive but none of this holds in the porn work context. Instead, porn workers develop sophisticated networks of mutual aid, share trade secrets with each other readily, and as we've seen, come with sharp class analyses. They know exactly where they stand. And so I wanna suggest that analyses and tactics like these might be a better fit for the contemporary economy than those favored by a labor left that in some ways is stuck hoping for Fordism's return. And one that sometimes wants workers who fit neatly into the class categories that marked it. So I'll close where I began, returning to the question of what we mean when we call porn work and what kinds of politics might emerge from that. There's part of the work aspect that's distasteful to me, Connor Habib said. I don't like the idea of jobs. The most obscene thing is working for a living. He went on, I'm tired of hearing people, especially feminists, say it's just a job. And I know we're not supposed to say that because we're at this moment where we're trying to prove to people that this is a job. But then Let's take one step beyond and say, okay, fuck jobs. Thank you. I'm excited to hear from you about the places that we might take this invitation. Excellent. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that. Um, I, I echo that final sentiment. <laughs> the, uh, and, and if you have questions, members of the audience, feel free to add them to the chat board. Um, that was a fantastic sort of overview of the work, but I would encourage everyone to, to pick up a copy and dive deeper into this. There's there's a lot more to it. Um, I'm curious to know, and I, I ask this of um, many of our guests, uh, and, I, and I feel like students are often kind of really curious to know sort of how, how a project like this comes together. Mm -hmm. um, and I think especially, um, you know, with a project like this, sort of what what assumptions did you have maybe heading into this project? And as you, um, I knew the number was, ha having read the book, I knew the number was high. I didn't realize you, you had 81 interviews. Um, 
and as you got sort of closer to the uh, the industry itself, you know, were were those assumptions confirmed, or sort of how did your thinking about this industry uh, evolve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, a couple of things that I, I had a background in sex worker organizing before I went to graduate school and started this project, um, but also labor organizing and mainstream jobs um, and labor policy. And so I came wanting to, in some ways, tell a standard workplace ethnography story about the industry, um, that so much of the conversation about porn has been focused on um, what it means to really everyone but workers, um, to consumers, to um, from an anti-porn feminist perspective to what I call third party consumers. So like not people who watch porn, but um, usually people gendered as women who are harmed because it even exists. Um, and, and so much focus on its representational politics. And so I just wanted to tell a story that porn was a job and think about what that meant, um, how, what working conditions were like, what is the set shop floor, um, how does pay work, how do people get into it, those kinds of questions. Um, so if anything, my assumption coming in was this is a job and we should talk about it as such. Um, and in some ways that was confirmed, um, but as you see today in others, people pushed back on that in a lot of ways. Um, I came in, I think, assuming that the story would be more about how unexceptional porn is. And in some ways that totally bore out. Um, but in others, uh, it became really clear that, that telling the story in such a way that ignored that porn was often a better job for a lot of people um, would be missing something. Um, and that in some, for some people, some of the time really doesn't feel like work in a traditional sense at all. Um, so that was the most surprising piece. And, and as you see um, in the, the final kind of where I close today, um, it's a tricky thing to, to from the perspective of, of Marxist labor ethnography to tell a story about, about, um, about people who disidentify with work and what, what we do with that. So I think that was the kind of primary journey. Um, the other piece, just in terms of like historically, um, when I started working on this project, um, in 2012, Los Angeles's Measure B was uh, being hotly debated, and that would have required uh, condom use on set. And I was really fascinated by the reality that workers were overwhelmingly against it. And there was something that felt like worth exploring more fully um, in what at the time seemed to me like a, a pretty exceptional thing um, where workers were allying with their bosses against occupational health regulation. And I wanted to figure out what was going on with that. That is, that's a very interesting um, sort of final moment in your book where you're sort of uh, just kind of really showcasing the spectrum of opinions on that particular piece of legislation and yeah, and how it runs counter to a lot of our assumptions about sort of, you know, employment and workplace safety. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know, and I guess uh, part of it, I'm realizing now, thinking back on my introduction, I feel like I kind of wrote um, wrote some of this into how I described your interactions with folks in this industry. Um, and I'm curious to know, like, from your opinion, I guess when I described the sort of, uh, you know, the care and the respect that you sort of had when interacting with folks in the industry, I feel like I'm I'm sort of reproducing this sort of exoticism with which scholars have approached the industry. Right over time, it seems like um, you know our our reluctance to treat porn work as work and therefore porn workers as workers um, has led to sort of a proliferation of a, a, a style of reading the industry um, that really sort of denies who these people are and what their material can do. We've been so focused on effects um, mm -hmm. that we've sort of um, allowed ourselves to, to look beyond the material realities that they're confronting on a daily basis. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, I, I think one of the, the strengths of this book, I mean, I, I love the way that you sort of tie together, you know, porn work as a type, you know, porn work as something that is not exceptional, even though, you know, in the popular imagination, it sort of occupies this very exceptional space. Um, 
and how it is like you know reflective of many of the trends in the contemporary labor marketplace, which may or may not actually be super contemporary, like this kind of gigification you're talking about. Um, but what I think you do a great job of is sort of highlighting the way that uh, you know people in porn work uh, wear different hats over the course of an afternoon. They're sort of, uh, you know, they're workers, but they're also managers. Um, and you describe them as people who would like, you know, rather not have bosses at all than organized against them. Um, and I'm kind of curious to know what you think, you know, in a, in a seminar series that's called the Labor Solidarity Project. Uh, you know, I, I mean, your conclusive remarks on you know, our nostalgia for a time of labor solidarity. I'm just kind of interested to to hear more about like, you know, what, maybe not what organizing looks like in, in porn work, but like what sort of labor solidarity looks like in porn work. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to say, you know, I, I absolutely read these forms of solidarity that I'll talk about in just a moment as organizing. I think my call is less to, um, to, disidentify with organizing as, as a, a priority for the labor movement and, and rather to, to expand what we think counts. Um, but yeah, I think um, one, one just kind of short, more recent anecdote that I'll share by way of illustrating the kinds of solidarities that you can find here um, is that in the early days of the pandemic, as so many in-person sex workers were moving online, um, they, you know, out of necessity, um, there was obviously just a, a, a tremendous glut in the labor market. Um, and all of us in this room know that this, that is not good <laughs> for pay, for working conditions. Um, but contrary to what one might assume um, in a neoliberal entrepreneurial uh, kind of community as this is often framed, um, more experienced online sex workers spent these early days of the pandemic, even as they were scrambling to uh, secure their own incomes, um, sharing information about how to make it in online work, how to protect your identity, how to work the hustle so that you can maximize your, your income, um, how to navigate and sometimes even hack platforms rules. Um, and sharing this information widely with sex workers they didn't even know online um, in some ways at great risk legally to themselves because policies like FOSTA SESTA can put at risk um, for trafficking charges anyone who helps people do sex work. Um, and so with all of those, those reasons not to do it, sex workers were still compiling information to teach each other um, how to navigate the transition. So that's just one example. Um, but there were also just countless moments um, on set, for example, where I just saw people taking care of each other in really um, uh, like visceral ways. Um, people sharing information about how to navigate a scene, how to no no negotiate with agents or directors, um, how to get out of a bad contract, all of these sorts of things, um, how to, you know, fib on an apartment lease application so that you can circumvent anti-sex worker discrimination. Um, so all of these forms of, of solidarity that I think are also organizing because they have a class character, um, because they take aim directly at managerial imperatives um, and also the, the wants of the capitalist state that wants to prevent um, people, especially women and queers from doing sex work um, and have a, you know, stronger controls over how they make money. Um, so I think that is class-based organizing. It's just not coming from a kind of tidy position um, of, of workers who are content to stay that way. Does that give some sense? It does, and actually, this um, somebody on the chat board. I see Joel has uh, chimed in. Who saw a film about the Lutzi ladies organizing with the SEIU mm -hmm. in San Francisco? Um, and I'm kind of interested now uh, because of Joel's comment. Um, I have read up on dancers in uh, Las Vegas who've actually formed unions over time. Um, in sort of this, I guess the the sort of situation of uh, you know. Uh, 
those those types of industries that are are sort of more in person i wonder if those sort of lend themselves to you know sort of old fashioned organizing in a way that you know uh you know everybody is sort of one one video away from being involved in porn work now right it's not it's not necessarily workplace based um like uh working in a um, you know a, a strip club would be right yeah yeah, I mean, so a couple of things. One, I mean, this is a great question, and I'm glad you, you all are watching this film about the lessee. That was an amazing campaign, um, and I think that that film does so much to, you know, to counter um, ideas about sex workers um, as incapable of organizing on their own behalf. And at the same time, it was a very short-lived um, campaign, and um, comparatively, I think you know, minor in terms of the, the wide range of self active, working class self activity that we see in sex working communities. And so I think it's not for nothing that um, that, that story often uh, lands with mainstream labor audiences in ways that other stories of uh, sex workers self-defense, mutual aid, uh, information sharing don't. And it's because it looks more like traditional unionizing. Um, and so I think that that's great. I'm glad that that partisans of that form of unionizing have one example that they can latch onto. Um, and I also, uh, there's a conversation in sex worker communities about the sort of outsized focus among civilians that is non-sex workers um, on this one moment in time, this one story. Um, so, all of that said, um, yeah, there are like really exciting, more traditional unionizing campaigns among dancers in particular. Um, but that is often not just made possible, but necessitated by the reality that it's harder to strike out on your own as a dancer um, because of capital investment. Like <laughs> to have your own OnlyFans page is a lot easier, obviously, than having your own club. Um, and so, the, the possibility of that form of organizing is born of constraint rather than uh, dancers being necessarily like a kind of more involved in their class consciousness than other communities of sex workers. Um, and that's why um, the conversation in that context is, yeah, it's, it's different because of the way that capital investment works. Um, but also it's true that like being in a workplace and working together makes building those forms of solidarities easier. Um, and that's a struggle with the move of the porn industry to um, you know, homes, cars, bedrooms around the world rather than LA and what's historically been called Porn Valley um, is that a lot of people don't even know each other anymore. And so online spaces are the, space, the only spaces um, where solidarities can be built. And at the same time, that is being constantly undermined again by policies like FOSTA-SESTA, which restrict uh, sex workers' online speech. And so that, um, that together with the loss of, of kind of physical space, meeting spaces, um, the loss of internet freedom is, is a, a real barrier to, to forming solidarities and to political organizing more broadly. Excellent, thanks. And I saw there, there's another question on the board, and I know you talk about this at length in your book. The um, the the differences between sort of mainstream uh, porn work conditions and feminist porn work, um, and and sort of its connection to that uh, your description of sort of authenticity work and and um, you know the reproductive labor involved in sort of performing a type of pleasure. Can you can you maybe get into that a bit? Um, and actually, I have to I have to let my dog into this room because it's scratching at the door. So I'll be right. Okay. There. Well, after after telling this story of of work interfering with someone's uh, ability to hang out with their dog, I have a lot of sympathy for that. Um, so um, yeah. So I mean, the the feminist porn piece is uh, in some ways I think like the most controversial so far um, aspect of this text, and that is. Um, I argue in the book that um, that there are a number of um, ethical problems inherent in ethical porn. Um, one of them is that it implicitly, I think, answers 
anti-sex worker feminists on their own terms. It accepts the premise that porn, um, that mainstream porn is anti-feminist, uh, that workers are treated uh, in uniquely bad ways in that context. Um, and it accepts, accepts anti-porn feminist premise that our primary terrain of struggle is representational, um, that porn's harms, uh, alleged, um, can be solved by producing porn that looks better, that looks more feminist, whatever that means, whether that is um, bodies that look authentic or um, storylines that uh, represent the kind of sex we are supposed to be having. Um, and so I think that at the level of even just discourse, that's a problem. Um, but feminist porn um, and various pornographies marked as ethical are also um, in some ways, uh, and those of us who are academics or have ever worked in artistic or nonprofit spaces know exactly what this feels like. Um, working for any business that frames itself as ethical means you're gonna get paid less and often work more. And if you complain about that, um, that means that you don't care about the politics of the thing. Um, and I, I had done a fair share of nonprofit work before coming to this project. And so, uh, including in feminist organizations, and I think I had uh, some inherent suspicion <laughs> about um, management who, who uh, frame their own managerial labor as not managerial, as somehow outside of capitalism. Uh, because it's marked as feminist. Um, and that is that is true of many feminist productions. Um, at the same time, they often do have um, some forms of, of working conditions that are better for workers. Um, it's more likely that workers get to choose their own partners, um, get to make their own decisions about um, protective, um, uh, about safer sex. Um, they tend to be um, less racist storylines and all of that matters. And at the same time, workers who either choose to perform in those genres or um, more commonly perform in them because they wouldn't be hired in mainstream, um, get paid less again to do more. Um, and that uh, whether that, that reads to you as feminist will just hinge on your definition of feminist um, praxis. And so there's something about it that feels a little lean in for me. Um, and that's something that I want to avoid. I think final, the final thing I'll say about that is that it, it seems to put the power to improve working conditions in management's hands um, rather than paying attention to the ways that workers are organizing around their own conditions, um, making their own demands, and as we saw in the talk today, um, devising ways of circumventing management entirely rather than changing out managers for kinder, gentler ones. Um, so let's see here. Um, Alex, do you wanna curate or shall I take it from the top? Sure, um, I, I've been trying to sort of work through the questions that they've come in and the questions have been fantastic. Yeah. Um, the, um, I was really surprised reading your book on the differentials in pay, uh, you know, surrounding ethical, ethical porn and, you know, feminist porn. I mean, I guess, as you said, sort of as someone who's been, um, you know, in, in, a, in a number of lines of work where I'm doing what I love that often also involves sort of not getting paid nearly as much, you know, mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, and, and this, I guess, sort of touches on the last comment that came in from Andrew. Um, you did, I, I mean, you, your book takes on race and representation. Uh, it, I mean, it's, it's not sort of its central focus, but I did, because you spent so much time, um, you know, interviewing folks in the industry, I was really curious about, um, and this actually touches on maybe another one of the questions that, that came in about folks sort of transitioning through the industry, going from, um, you know, performer to producer to, um, you know, to sort of uh, acquiring more of the means of production, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but in the case of, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of Lexington Steel, um, and then there was one other performer who eventually became a producer of a, a you know, a, of an uh, what was it, Silverback Entertainment, sort of, uh, you know, sort of playing on, uh, you know, archaic racial tropes. I, I'm sort of curious about whether, 
you know, the performers, um, was there a sense of, uh, you know, complicity or, or sort of responsibility in rehearsing those racial scripts that have, again, like historically been applied to, you know, brown and black bodies to, you know, to really rationalize violence and, and over-policing. And I think, um, you know, some of the observations were really interesting and empowering, but some of them were also really, really troubling and kind of, you know, speak to the antithesis of sort of the kind of maybe solidarity or, or sort of, um, you know, I was just surprised to hear, you know, a, a, you know, a, a black performer talking about race in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, were they sort of cognizant of the, the politics that often get framed around those representations? Absolutely cognizant. Yeah. And, I'm, and I, I'll say, I'll just preface this by saying, you know, I, I don't think it's my place as a white woman, but really any, like, and, and the place of anyone who's not a black sex worker to determine um, whether or not it's ethical to make money off those representations. So I, from, from my perspective, um, you know, if, if, if black workers make a calculation that this makes sense to them, um, then that's enough explanation for me. Um, but yeah, I do think there are these interesting conversations about what uh, about solidarity is with not just among workers, but with you know working class people in general who um, who may or may not be um, you know face the consequences of representational norms. Although I think that the, the there's an outsized focus on um, how how the porn industry in general, but in particular sex workers, um, on their responsibility to um, to decide to opt out of those representations. Um, so there's all of that. Um, but um, in terms of like black performer managers own self-understanding around this, yeah, people were really straightforward with me about the calculations that they were making. Um, Lexington just said, uh, he even used the, the term uh, identifying himself as porn's proletariat class. And he was a black studies major in undergrad and he knows the history um, and said like either white men are gonna make money off this or I am. And, um, and I think that makes sense, you know? So, um, so there are also some, including feminist and queer directors um, who decide that they're not comfortable um, or ethically willing to participate in perpetuating those kinds of representations and they opt out and um and tell other kinds of stories um but but again i'm i'm interested in you know how much weight gets placed on on sex working people to solve uh the problem of you know historical representation broadly conceived um but yeah i think it's very tricky and i don't know that um, that there's any resolution to those questions um, under this economic system. Like you either uh, participate in what representations or forms of extraction or whatever um, that, uh, you know, that have caused you injury um, and you try to claim power over them in some kind of way, um, or you give up that power to a boss. Um, and I think Again, because of the possibilities for class mobility in porn, um, porn workers are encountering that double bind in a much more immediate way. Um, but I don't think that it's different from the kinds of concerns around small business entrepreneurship, uh, say among uh, immigrant communities uh, more, more generally. That's just one example. Well, I think when we shift the conversation to looking sort of exclusively at representation, again, we're you know, overlooking the material realities of the folks involved in the the, the work itself. Um, I yeah, guess, I oh, sorry. If I could just jump in really quickly and just say, um, you know, another thing that for those interested in the politics of representation, I've rather like stubbornly avoided them in my book, um, only because the focus has been so much there. Um, but Black feminist porn scholarship has so much to offer um, in terms of the conversation around how representations land differently for different kinds of consumers. And so um, just for those interested thinking about um, work from Ariane Cruz and Jen Nash and Marie Miller Young and um, folks who are thinking about how crucial it is that we not assume that everyone who watches porn 
is watching from the perspective of white men. Um, and then thus, you know, reading scenes in the ways that, that commentators imagine white men would. Um, so I just wanted to add that piece, but yeah, back to you. Excellent, thanks. Um, and, and I realize I wanna be mindful of time here. So we've probably got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, I've just got so many, I, th this book was so fascinating. It's one of those ones where I felt satisfied putting it down, but also it just, you know, the, the proverbial hamster was in the wheel just kind of chugging away. Um, there, there was a question on the board that, um, that had to do with uh, regulations that producers have to abide by when directing porn scenes. And that, that, that sort of um, dovetailed nicely with this, I, I think kind of what we see is these larger trends in management to regulate porn workers as you know, independent contractors, um, you know, which, which simultaneously like abdicates any sort of employer liability or responsibility. Um, mm -hmm. And, and really kind of like creates that, you know, that idea of like the impossible subject, right? It's somebody who's like denied rights, but is also simultaneously like heavily policed and hyper surveilled. Um, so can you maybe just give the audience a sense of, um, you know, what exactly that, what the regulation mechanics look like um, and, you know, uh, what kind of rights uh, foreign workers have in those situations? Yeah, I mean, I think the first and most important piece here is that the regulations on the books and regulations on the ground are just completely different worlds um, of policy for porn and for other workers. And so um, there are um, some limited regulations that govern um, how independent contractors and particularly those in the state of California um, because of its historic relationship to Hollywood, um, how what, what are called day employees um, and actors and creative fields are treated. Um, and uh, at the same time, as in much other gig work, but also increasingly in traditional employment, um, bosses ignore regulations and the state does nothing. Um, so, and there are, this is also a question in terms of like where our priorities should lie around um, lobbying for better regulation when enforcement is so lax. Um, but uh, yeah, as you say, like, yeah, this kind of limbo um, around gig work uh, for porn workers is um, even worse because gig workers as uh, actual independent contractors are legally entitled to copyright over what they create. Um, and that uh, does not, that is never the case um, in terms of how porn workers who sign a, a copyright release are treated by their employers. So, um, so they have, employers then have the kind of the best of both worlds. They have no liability. Um, and get all of the profits, no royalties, no residuals, nothing. Um, but em employees are supposed to have, you know, of course, access to occupational health regulation, um, to disability insurance, uh, and to formal protections around uh, racist hiring norms, around sexual harassment, et cetera. Um, but we just know, any of you who've had a job know that all of this is largely theoretical. Um, so I, I do argue in the book that against a solution that much of the labor left puts forward, um, which is that if we just clarify who's an employee and who's an independent contractor, much of this will be solved. Um, I think this isn't true, A, because of these enforcement issues, um, but also again, because most performers don't want to be employees. Um, they want to own their own content. Um, and so forcing them to choose between these categories that are born of the really brittle uh, New Deal era accord between capital uh, and labor, um, I think is an impossible choice that both won't deliver on its promises and also its promises are quite weak. Um, so that's a big answer to the regulations question. Um, I there's There are things to say in terms of like what the formal responsibilities of directors are around um, testing, uh, STI testing and um, use of, you know, of safer sex methods. Um, but in many ways, 
the lack of enforcement, I think, again, makes this quite abstract. Um, and I'll close this answer with just one anecdote that I, from, that I overheard from uh, an employer's attorney at the, one of the porn conventions. A uh, director asked about enforcement around occupational health. And she said, oh, just don't worry. Like there, OSHA's not even paying attention to all the construction workers falling off roofs, so you're fine. And that's true. I mean, this is like when we're talking about this in the context of austerity, um, that matters more than the letter of the law. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a sad state of affairs for sure. Um, we've got one, uh, one final big question in the chat board that I think, I mean, it, it, it sort of makes sense as a, a closer. Um, this one sort of talks about life after porn work. Mm -hmm. uh, with the with the the big question of just what happened, and I think you talk about this in the in in the book, um, you know what happens to sex workers as they get older, yeah. and then is there a, a way that the porn industry itself can can sort of fight against um, beauty standards to allow people to perform porn work for longer if they choose to do so? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this this question around what people in the industry often call aging out is really, um, it's a crucial question um, in an industry where, you know, traditionally the understanding has been that one has just a few good years. Um, and that's not, I think often um, an anti-porn read suggests that this because consumers have this like inordinate fascination with youth, which is sometimes true, um, but it's also because when shooting for other people and particularly when contracting with an agent, um, the standard was for agents to, I'm gonna quote a performer here, get as much work out of you as they possibly can until you're shot out and then your, your, um, you know, your star has fallen. And so workers have always had really creative um, responses to this, whether that be trying to move into directing roles or um, historically a really common move has been to use porn stardom to get a leg up on the erotic dance circuit. Um, and for those interested in the history of this, there's a podcast called The Rialto Report that has really wonderful stories around, along these lines. Um, but increasingly, especially as more and more workers are self-producing, um, these kind of old rules about who's marketable are really crumbling. Um, and, uh, and that both shapes the possibilities for, for future work for workers as they age, um, but also for people who either would have been relegated into you know, really fetishizing productions, uh, particularly racialized and trans workers, um, and then folks who never would have been hired by a producer in the first place, people with visible disabilities, um, people, uh, fat people, um, various categories of, of would-be performers who were written out of representation um, before and who in some cases are now making more money than the people that uh, that agents had thought were the only marketable um, kind of um, bodies or genres in the first place. And so I think there's something there around um, the reality that sex workers, because they're in, in closer contact with fans and with clients, um, have a much deeper, but also more capacious understanding of the reality that there is a market for everyone. Um, and that directly contradicts what many agents and traditional producers told me about what sells. Excellent. Thank you for that answer. And thank you for all of these answers. It's just, it's so nice to, um, I mean, one of the joys of the seminar series is to get to, you know, read work and then actually talk to the authors and, and sort of, uh, you know, see the, you know, the, the ideas sort of animated through the actual uh, Q&A. So this has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for everyone who uh, zoomed in to hear this talk. Uh, I cannot encourage you enough to go out and buy this book. It is absolutely fantastic. It is, uh, it hit the press just this month, right? It official, official Monday. Yeah. Oh my God. I didn't realize that. Oh, now that makes me feel really special. Um, <laughs> congratulations to you. Cause this is really, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's one that I'm going to be using in class for years to come. Um, so it was just such an honor to get a chance to talk to you and, um, 
and yeah, best of luck on your next project. Do you have a next project in mind or you take, you take your victory lap, of course. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I, uh, for all my anti-work sentiments, I'm bad at, at relaxing. So I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm done a, a bunch of interviews for a, a next book on um, an intellectual history of the sex worker left. Um, so thinking about the history of sex worker communisms um, and I'm really, so moving away from labor ethnography, but but trying to dive deeper into some of the threads that I was only able to touch on here, but just around the kinds of anti-capitalist critique that are born of, of um, being at the front lines in the ways that many sex workers are. So, so that's my next order of business. Excellent. All right, well, we uh, look forward to it and thank you again so much for, for joining us today. Thank really. you so much for having me. Um, and if folks, uh, have questions from the chat. I haven't been following the chat, but um, folks have questions that I didn't get to. Feel free to to either hang back in the room or shoot me an email. I'm happy to address them.